Gracias. Y estamos. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenos días. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenos días. Agradecemos que estén el día de hoy acompañándonos en este diálogo de saberes sobre cuidados, paz y la sostenibilidad de la vida. Agradecemos también toda la colaboración de la Universidad Jaume I de España para organizar este ciclo de diálogos. En especial agradezco muchísimo a la doctora Mercedes Alcañiz Moscardó, directora de la Unidad de Igualdad de Género, por todo su apoyo y colaboración. Como sabemos, los cuidados están en el centro de nuestra vida y la de todo el planeta. Esta pandemia ha dejado claro la urgencia de la participación de todas las personas, no solamente las mujeres en los cuidados, y que igualmente hay una visión de seguridad y políticas públicas que lo consideren en su centralidad. Hoy sabemos que no habrá paz, ni seguridad, ni desarrollo económico, ni vida sin poner a las personas y su cuidado en el centro. Por ello, hemos organizado estos diálogos de saberes en los que participarán colegas que nos comparten miradas diversas sobre los cuidados y su importancia para sostener la vida y la paz. A continuación, quiero presentar a The Care Collective, responsable del manifiesto de los cuidados que nos presentarán el día de hoy. Tenemos aquí con nosotras a Andreas Chatsidakis, quien es profesor de Mercadotecnia y Ética del Consumidor en la Escuela de Administración y Negocios de la Escuela Royal Holloway de la Universidad de Londres. Entre sus publicaciones están el informe Consuming Modern Slavery Report en el 2018, Ethics and Morality in Consumption de 2016. El doctor Jaime Hacking trabajó en la revista, quien, quien trabajó en la revista Attitude de 2003 y actualmente es profesor de estudios de los medios de comunicación en la Universidad de Anglia del Este. Es el investigador principal del proyecto Intimidades Digitales financiado por el Consejo de Investigación Económico Social ESRC en asociación con el fideicomiso Terrence Higgins y es autor de Work That Body Mail Bodies in Digital Culture 2019. También está con nosotros Jo Littler, es profesora del Departamento de Sociología y directora del Centro de Investigación de Género y Sexualidades en la Universidad de la Ciudad de Londres, Londres. En, en Reino Unido. Sus publicaciones incluyen Against Meritocracy, Radical Consumption y en coautoría con Rosy Nadeau, The Politics of Heritage, The Legacies of Race. También está con nosotros la doctora Catherine Rottenberg, quien es profesora titular en estudios americanos y canadienses en la Universidad de Nottingham. Sus publicaciones incluyen The Rise of Neoliberal, Neoliberal Feminism, Black Harlem and the Jewish Lower East Side, y Performing Americanes. También está Lian Sigal, quien es profesora de Psicología y de Estudios de Género en Brickbeck, Universidad de Londres. Sus muchas publicaciones incluyen Beyond the Fragments, What is to be done about the family, Por qué el feminismo, Psicología, Género y Políticas, Slow Motion, Change, Changing Masculinities, Changing Men, Straight Sex, Making Trouble, And, y Out of Time de 2013. Agradecemos mucho que estén aquí con, con nosotros. Sean bienvenidas, bienvenidos y pues muchas gracias. Les cedo la palabra. So thank you so much, Elvia. And I just want to apologize that Jamie was unable to make it tonight. So it's just the four of us. Um, and I want to wish everybody a good uh, morning, I know, in Mexico and good afternoon here in London. It's really wonderful to be part of the care, peace and sustainable, sustainability of life um, conversations. And I'd like to thank the Gender and Inclusion Program and Elvia and Jorge in particular for reaching out and inviting the Care Collective to speak today. So thank you so much and for all of the participants. What I thought we'd do is I'm gonna begin by giving just a brief introduction, introduction of the Care Collective um, and the Care Manifesto. And then I'm gonna hand, my, hand the, the, the Zoom over to my, my colleagues to speak more in detail about some of our major arguments in the Care Manifesto. 
So I'm going to begin by just saying a few words about the Care Collective, how it came to be, and how we understand this notion of care in the Care Manifesto. Um, so the Care Collective was created as a reading group in the fall of 2017. We just were a few colleagues that wanted to come together to think and read together about um, the notion of care. We wanted to read and think about it from a range of perspectives. We wanted to try and make sense of what we saw as the multiple crises of care already engulfing the world. So rising inequality everywhere, endless war, the refugee crisis, and looming over everything, of course, imminent environmental catastrophe. And we met for about two years. We read, we discussed, we debated, and sometimes seriously disagreed. Um, and then eventually we decided that we wanted to write something. We wanted to write a manifesto, which became the CARE Manifesto, the Politics of Interdependence. Now, we began writing in 2019, so we could never have anticipated how grimly urgent COVID would make our manifesto. And in our manifesto, what we do is we argue that the current global crisis in which we find ourselves is indeed primarily a crisis of care. It's the result of histories of colonial, imperialist, and misogynist, and white supremacist violence, then compounded by now decades of intensified neoliberal policies prioritizing profit over people. I mean, we've witnessed now years of austerity measures, years of intensified deregulation and privatization, and we've also witnessed years of devaluing care practices and care work. And of course, that's in large part due to CARE's historical association with and to women and to the domestic sphere. And what this has all meant is that neoliberal nation states have been utterly unable and sometimes even unwilling to cope swiftly or effectively with the spread of coronavirus. So on the one hand, what we, what we suggest is that COVID-19 has dramatically and horrifically exposed what we call in the manifesto, the reigning politics of carelessness. But on the other hand, the pandemic has also dramatically exposed our profound interdependencies. It's highlighted our shared vulnerability and that the need for care is part and parcel of the human condition. And so we argue that if the pandemic has taught us anything so far, and let's hope that it has, is that we are in urgent need of a radically new politics that puts care front and center of life. In fact, one of our main motivations for writing the manifesto was our conviction that we had become way, we had become way too accustomed to this dystopic visions. And what we really wanted to do was to offer a collaborative and utopian one and what we call what we call a feminist, queer, anti-racist and eco-socialist vision. And there are a few key premises that undergird the vision that we lay out in the manifesto. One is that building a caring world begins first and foremost by recognizing that our survival and our thriving are everywhere and always contingent on others. So in other words, creating caring alternatives to our careless realities involves avowing our mutual interdependencies and addressing the inevitable ambivalences at the heart of care, of care and caregiving. Another key premise is that only by ensuring that communities have ample resources, infrastructure, and time can we create the conditions that render a caring disposition towards the other, however distant, ever more possible? So when we started writing the manifesto, it was clearly a kind of intellectual ex exercise. We asked ourselves, what would the world look like if the organizing principle were care? And in an effort to conjure up this world in our imaginations and on, on paper, we just, or on the screen, we decided to look at different scales from the planetary through economic economies and the state communities and our intimate kinship structures. And the manifesto begins by diagnosing the interconnecting, interconnected nature of the current reign of carelessness. So we travel from the global dimensions that have produced the climate crisis and economies that put profit over people and travel, and then we travel down as it were to careless states, economies and communities how the banality of carelessness affects our interpersonal intimacies. But then we travel outward, scaling up from the interpersonal to the planetary in order to outline caring alternatives to our contemporary condition of carelessness. 
And we use this structure of scales because what we want to show is how our capacities to care are interdependent and can only be cultivated and realized by avowing these inextricable interconnections. Now, Lynn, Joe, and Andreas will be presenting some of these caring alternatives that we lay out in the Care Manifesto, and they'll scale up as it were. Now, all of this means, as we argue, is, 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 is that all of this means that we need to expand our understanding and politics of care. So care cannot be understood only as the hands-on care people do when directly looking after the physical and emotional needs of others. Rather, the vision that we offer is one that advances a model of universal care, universal care, where care is understood as an enduring capacity and practice involving the nurturing of all that is necessary for the welfare and the flourishing of human and non-human life. So care is our individual and common ability to provide the political, social, material, and emotional conditions that allow for the greatest possible number of people and living creatures on this planet, along with the planet itself, to thrive. So I'm now gonna hand over the, the Zoom to, to Lynn. Lynn, you're on, you're on mute. Thank you, Catherine. And it is really exciting to be here, almost in Mexico, for your important new course on our crucial topic of the moment on care plus peace and sustainability, they all simply tie together. So in thinking about how we discuss the dilemmas and complexities of care, we need, first of all, to ponder why this crucial area of existence, what we all need throughout our lives, has been so undervalued. And um, that's what I'm going to talk about now. Why has care been traditionally so undervalued? As Catherine said, we wrote the manifesto simply as a call to arms, a call to care because we could see the wretched state of carelessness all around us, falling spending on care across the board, around the globe, the outsourcing of resources, leading to daily scandals in Britain, but also elsewhere, daily scandals of neglect and abuse long before the COVID pandemic struck. And now, of course, in the UK, we have over 100,000 dead. I know you have tens of thousands dead there in Mexico. And we also know that this is very much to do with the crisis of care we've been living with, and therefore how very urgently we need to prioritize care if we're ever to create better lives for all of us and to create actually any sustainable future for humans and the rest of living things. So all too briefly then saying something about the devaluation of care, I begin from reflecting that care has always been undervalued because it's still predominantly seen as women's work, something that happens in women's sphere, which traditionally went unpaid and was barely seen as work at all. It was routinely marginalized as unproductive. However often feminists have pointed out again and again that care is essential to our economy. Indeed, it's the beating heart of our economy. But even on the left, real politics tended to prioritize what it saw as productive jobs, as if social reproduction, that is the production of the work, is the maintenance of the work, as all that goes into um, producing generation after generation is not also an essential part of the economy is not also the key to what keeps the wheels of production and reproduction turning. So caring has always been gendered. That's one reason it's been undervalued. Yet in today's world where women and men alike are working 
often very long hours in paid jobs, what we see is a huge care deficit in richer countries. <clears throat> and this has been met by a whole global care chain of predominantly poor immigrant non-white women who've performed much of our caring work in richer countries such as Britain or the US, etc. Thus, racism combines with traditional sexism as well as global inequality to further devalue caring. And crucially as well, care work is undervalued and indeed often repudiated. That is something you know, we don't want to admit we're a part of because of widespread contempt for and devaluation of so-called dependency. Symbolic manhood has always been seen as the very antithesis of dependency. Now you'd think post-feminism that such notions of dependency would be long dead, but sadly this gender cliche has actually been strengthened by the last four decades of neoliberal exaltation of individual resilience, autonomy and productivity, thereby actually deepening the disavowal of human fragility and human dependence throughout our lives. So ideal citizens, male and female, and whatever our age, must be tough and entrepreneurial, always self-sufficient <clears throat> and encouraged to embrace that um, self-care, only self-care, looking after ourselves is what is to be, be valued. So this pathologizing of dependency was used to justify the deadly dismantling of welfare and the culling of public resources which in richer countries we've seen occurring over the last four decades. In Britain, it began with, Th with Thatcher at the start of the 1980s and was never really turned around. And further reasons for marginalizing and devaluing caring work is that it actually can be extremely challenging work. The very concept of care itself overflows with paradoxes and also with ambivalence about wanting and needing to care and the difficulties of providing care, generating conflicting emotions, which are rarely given due attention or respect. And this is because attending fully to the needs of any living thing means confronting vulnerability our own and others' vulnerability. And it can be both troubling and exhausting. Thus, hands-on caring, caring for others, however rewarding, can be daunting, bringing us into contact with our own and with others' mortal embodied selves. So this is why also it's been traditionally relegated to women or to servants, people deemed inferior, because this is the sort of visceral, tactile work of maintenance that they do. And outsourcing it in this way to other people thereby enables us to disavow thoughts of our own inescapable fragility, our own inevitable mortality. So the point is that care and caring has been something the poor have always had to do, been made to do, but the rich have been more enabled to invade, to evade caring, not having to, having to care, becoming a sign of their affluence, having plenty of people to care for them while pretending that they themselves are not really dependent. Moreover, the challenges of care and anxieties about doing it well or even doing it adequately can easily fuel resentment in caring relationships and all the more so given the cultural devaluation of care. 
So it's true, even in that mythologized mother-child bond, which feminists have always written about um, <clears throat> and continue um, to write about movingly, we, we, we still find a certain inevitability of maternal ambivalence or worse, the disowned, confused and contradictory emotions that mothers can have towards their children. Hence, as I've been saying, positive and negative emotions easily entwine with our capacities to care. And it's precisely because of these complexities and challenges that we really need to fight for the necessary social infrastructures that can assist us in caring for others. We know that the pressures of today's job markets routinely mean people barely have time to provide for our own essential needs or the essential needs of those who immediately depend upon us, let alone pay heed to the situation of others in need of care. More time, adequate resources are simply essential to facilitate mutually fulfilling and imaginative practices of, of care at every scale. Indeed, far from public spending creating the pathologies of dependency, as people like Margaret Thatcher and others on the right like to say, the reverse is true. Only with adequate and secure resources can everyone develop and maintain whatever capabilities they have to ensure some sense of autonomy, some sense of being able to care for others and also escape being rendered helpless and passive. This is well illustrated by disability rights activists arguing for a particular notion of independence and control over their lives despite and because of their recognition of their dependence on distinct forms of care. So dependence and independence are actually tied together because we all depend on care at some level. So we need to break once and for all that very destructive linking of dependency with pathology and to accept that we are all in different ways formed in and through our interdependencies. So this is what reimagining a caring politics, reinventing a language of care entails, accepting our dependence, plus the ambivalence this can generate. And it means fully valuing all the skills and resources necessary to promote care in all its manifestations. For we all need both to give care and receive care to sustain a sense of our common humanity that ties us in with talk of peace and to help us to confront our shared fears of human frailty rather than project them onto others we label as dependent. This is the very seedbed for the growth of the right. So now I want to hand over to Joe, who's going to say, more about those wider structures of care that we all, in fact, depend upon. Thanks, Jo. Thanks, Lynn, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, and yes, looking forward to the conference. So we are sketching out some of the different chapters in our book. I'm going to talk about communities to ask what do caring communities look like? Well, they don't all look the same. And in the manifesto, we highlight a lot of different progressive examples of practice, past and present. But we do argue that they tend to have certain features that together create what can be called social infrastructures of care. They always involve creating shared space, whether public or green space, cycle lanes, public transport, pedestrian and play streets, parks and community centres. They always involve shared resources on a variety of scales, such as, for example, free public broadband, schools, hospitals, water fountains, 
and the sharing of books through public libraries, as well as also the sharing of things like kitchen hardware, garden tools and toys, all that equipment people use occasionally or on a short term basis. And there are plenty of grassroots examples of these libraries of things already in existence, as well as all the other shared facilities of social infrastructure. We also argue that caring communities facilitate shared activities. So in the UK, the Greater London Council of the 1980s was so creative in democratizing arts and culture in creating community media and festivals which were genuinely diverse. Well, we might think of how the newer forms of municipalism, which are emerging globally from Preston to Barcelona to Jackson, which are facilitating the rebirth of community life, of high streets, promoting co-ops and pushing for affordable housing, as they offer models of what's sometimes called community wealth building, including through progressive procurement at anchor institutions like universities and through making international alliances like the transnational gathering Fearless Cities. And we might also think of the great mutual aid neighborhood projects that have sprung up during the pandemic, or in Mexico, the participatory grassroots projects of the Zapatistas in Chiapas. So local experiments are important in creating caring communities, we argue, as is the work of scaling them up. So for example, we could think about how um, in the UK, the women's liberation crashes led to a network of nationwide nurseries, or how the Tredegar Mutual Aid Society in South Wales at the end of the 19th century was the model that was scaled up to form the NHS, the, Nat the National Health Service, after the Second World War. So to do such kind of scaling up needs political engagement, and it needs resource. And here we argue that reversing the spending cuts as accelerated by neoliberalism and neoliberal austerity politics is crucial. We also highlight that it's critically important that any resource is shared and not just siphoned off to unaccountable private companies. As in England, we see happening now under COVID with the test and trace system, or as in, we saw in the, in the US with Trump's huge donations to oil companies using COVID relief money. So expanding the commons or what we collectively own in terms of space, resources and democratic engagement is really key. This involves insourcing instead of outsourcing. It involves reversing the privatization of schools and hospitals and bringing back essential services into public ownership. So for example, care homes have been brought back into public ownership recently in British Columbia, in Canada. Or we can also think about the creation of cooperative systems of social care, like the Burtzog system in the Netherlands, where instead of multiple carers working brutal 15 minute shifts and not dealing with the same person, they have a dedicated group of people working on an ongoing and cooperative basis to address the health and social care needs <clears throat> that arise from one specific person's needs. So collectively, we think and we argue that all these strategies mean that no one can profit from pain. And so the work of hands-on caring is materially as symbolically valued through better pay and conditions. We advocate rolling back neoliberalism, in other words, in favor of universal basic services and a mixed economy of collective ownership and activities. Because doing all this means we're also extending people's ability to participate in the world and to deepen local democracy, to enable us, as Lynn said, to care and be cared for. So we present this as a template for creating caring communities and of how we can really take back control in a sustainable and pleasurable rather than proto-fascistic disaster capitalist form. Thank you. And over to Andreas. Thank you, Joe. Um, 
So I'm going to talk next about the uh, caring economies and basically try to briefly answer the question of uh, what a caring economy would, could look like. And uh, to begin with, it is fair to say that it will have to involve more caring market actors. So in the diagnostic part of the manifesto, we introduced the idea of care washing. Uh, briefly, uh, communication strategies designed to demonstrate how caring a corporation is in a way that often distracts from that corporation's actual destructive social and environmental impacts. So during the first lockdown, for example, we had companies such as Amazon, uh, a corporation ordered, among others, to close its friends' factories on the basis of not respecting any health and safety standards, uh, running a campaign claiming the exact opposite. And I quote here, keeping our people safe while getting you the things you need has never been more important, end quote. Uh, but of course, a caring economy is not just about uh, caring corporations, if that can ever be uh, the case. Um, as we see at the beginning of our caring economy section, uh, we need to go beyond economies. We need to reimagine the economic as all that enable us to take care of each other. So put differently, economies do not just comprise markets, consumers and producers. They also comprise the material and immaterial care provisioned within our households, communities, states and the world at large. So for us, the nature and scope of the economic has to be re-embedded within a society where care really is its organizing principle and universal care is its underlying model. So here we follow the work of various alternative socialist and feminist economies, such as Nancy Polber, Ryan Eisler, Kate Raworth, Women's Budget Group, to argue for a different economic vision, one that places all economic activity from household to state provisioning uh, within a capacious understanding of society, and which is in turn understood as part of the ecology of the living world. And we also join many of these authors in asserting that care and capitalist market logics cannot be reconciled. There are many reasons for that, uh, for that uh, um, observation, but very briefly, uh, first, there are few forms of intimate care work that are not best delivered with personal engagement and emotional attachment that cannot be quantified or reduced to market metrics. Second, markets can only allocate care responsibilities and services on the basis of buying power. Given current income inequalities, nationally and internationally, this is clearly not good for universal care and social justice. Third, market norms are notorious for crowding out non-market values. In other words, marketizing care foregrounds self-interest and instrumentality in every sphere of our uncaring lives. Uh, think for instance, a nanny who does anything the kids want with a view to increase the ratings on uh, www.care.com. I don't know if you're familiar with that website, but very briefly, it's where the gig economy meets the care economy. Or think of a medical doctor working in private practice who is keen to process as many patients as possible with a view to increase their daily targets. So where do we go from here? Um, in the manifesto, we suggest a two-pronged strategy that addresses both the marketization of care and the very nature of our current market systems. So first, we argue that we need to demarketize and decommodify all our care infrastructures. Uh, for example, we could begin by resocializing and insourcing our care commons, as uh, George just argued, or by bringing financial capital onshore as opposed to keeping it offshore. Second, however, uh, we also have to ponder the question whether markets can ever be caring. And here we're not talking about the institution of the capitalist market, but the actual markets that we go to find the services and products that we need, our local marketplaces, if you like, or our digital marketplaces. And an obvious answer here again, however, is no, if what we mean by that is markets driven by logics of capital accumulation. But not all economic or marketplace activity is driven by logics of capital accumulation. Uh, we have to emphasize that, and we have to start building and recognizing already existing, more caring, equitable, and eco-socialist alternatives to capitalist markets. Such alternatives can and do take many different forms, cooperatives, nationalization, progressive municipalism, localization, public commons partnerships. Through all these strategies and more, we need to ensure that consumers are reconnected with producers and care receivers are reconnected with caregivers. 
And we have numerous examples here from a small structure in Athens that directly linked Zapatista producers with Greek consumers uh, to the already scaled up solidarity economy structures of Spain, now accounting, according to some estimates, for roughly 10% of the country's GDP. So in a way, the seeds of radical economic change are already here, and they are embedded in local societies and communities where care in many ways is already their organizing principle. So talking about the seeds of radical economic change, um, the last section of our manifesto uh, scales up to consider caring for the world. And um, I'm going to very briefly talk about it here, but what we do in that chapter is talk about the need to scale up our model of universal care to the global level by fostering transnational institutions, global networks and alliances uh, to implement among others, a global Green New Deal, uh, debt cancellation, and financial re-regulation and porous borders, whilst at the same time embracing logics of democratic cosmopolitanism. So overall then, to conclude, uh, we need a global alliance of caring connections, a widespread avowal of our interdependence in all of its ever-present complexities and challenges across different scales. And that's how we conclude the manifesto. Thank you. I think we can take questions now. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> so we finished our presentation. We'd be happy to. Here is Elvia. <laughs> take any questions. Lynn, you're on mute. One more thing we could add is that if our uh, co-writer, Jamie, had been here with us, he would have actually talked about um, where people most associate care, which is the family, the nuclear family, and um, to argue that we need to broaden that out. We actually talk about a promiscuous notion of care, saying that anybody can learn to care for anybody else. And we saw that during the age crisis, we saw it in mutual aid practices today. So we're very much for broadening out the context and places, even in which that hands-on intimate care occurs. And yeah, I think there's a question in Spanish. Um, unfortunately, I can't read. Sí, es más bien un comentario de María Teresa Martín. Eh, no sé si podemos abrirle el, el micrófono a María Teresa Jorge. Ella sí. también será ponente. No. Hola, eh, buenas, buenos días. Siento hablar en, en español, mi inglés no es muy bueno. No Felicidades. Escuchamos. ¿Me escuchan bien? ¿No? Sí. Eh, bueno, eh, felicidades por el manifiesto. Me he sentido muy cercana, muy identificada con todas las preocupaciones de, en las que estoy trabajando. Y me gusta mucho también la línea de Joan Tronto. Eh, he trabajado mucho en ella y, y me ha gustado también esa idea ¿no? de que la opción de cuidar la economía está dejando de lado la, la opción de cuidar la vida, el entorno, lo humano y y lo no humano, y bueno, pues hay un tema que me ha parecido especialmente interesante, esa idea de esa danza entre la, la interdependencia y la independencia, me ha parecido muy bonito como, como figura, y bueno, por si quieren comentar un poquito más de cómo se les ocurrió. Y luego también hay otra cuestión que tiene que ver con otra de las autoras que a mí me gusta mucho, que son los trabajos de Donna Haraway, y esto a la cuestión también del ensamblaje con las tecnologías también, ¿no? que, bueno, un poco cómo lo veían en esta perspectiva. Y nada, felicidades, gracias por ese gran trabajo, eh, y yo creo que es muy, muy estimulante. 
I'll just say something about um, the dance <laughs> of dependence and interdependency, because one thing that um, we also are always pointing out is that there is a reciprocal relation between caring and being cared for. It's not just that one person does all the giving and one person does all the receiving. What we say is actually, you know, to feel our common humanity, we need to care and to feel um, that people need us to care for them. Indeed, you know, part of the isolation and loneliness of old age can be no longer having people to care for, not just that we need to be cared for ourselves. So there's a real closeness between dependency and interdependency, caring and being cared for. For us, that's what it is to be human. That's what the, you know, acknowledging our interdependence as the seedbed of humanity is all about. And maybe someone else wants to add in here. I'll just take the um, Joan Tronto. Yes, we've been, I mean, a lot of our reading in the reading group was around the feminist ethics of care. And we were very influenced by Joan Tronto in particular because of the expansion of the ethics of care from a moral standpoint to into the, into the public sphere and into a politics. And I think we, we draw very heavily on her distinction between caring for, about, and with, which is um, the notion that we then take up and think about how, how, you know, expanding that notion, perhaps even further thinking about the ambivalences, not just the conflicts of care, but the real ambivalences um, it, with and in caring, which so we're bringing in psychosocial and uh, some psychoanalytic insights into, you know, human aggression, that how do we, and I think that the questions that we ask are of, of a different nature almost. Um, so what are the conditions of possibility that would allow for the, kinding, the kind of caring society that we envision? And I think that that's a politics of care rather than an ethics per se of care. And I think that distinction is important and one that we've been thinking about a lot in these conversations, because that's a question that we receive a lot in terms of, you know, and also the capaciousness with which we understand care and this idea of, inter, you know, universal care, which actually shifts according to the scale in which we are addressing, you know, what does caring community, what is a caring community? How does a caring community, uh, what does it look like? And how does it differ from caring economies? And there are certain premises that I tried to outline at the beginning that are this are that basically trans, trans, that, that cut across the different scales. And yet at each scale, there is a certain kind of uniqueness that needs to be taken into account. Um, now, I know there was a question about technology. Maybe, Joe, you... Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for that. It's it's um, very useful to think with. Um, in relation to Donna Haraway, what I take from Haraway is that technology is never neutral. You always have to consider how it's gendered, how it's classed, how it's racialized, how it connects to our different environments. So I think that's that's useful to think with uh, when it comes to care, because you know similarly, technology, caring technologies are not neutral; they have a politics to them, and so they can be used in different ways. And I think you know, uh, and they can be used in progressive ways or regressive ways. And it's important that we pick those different elements apart. Um, under the pandemic, for example, we can we've seen the explosion of use of uh, technology like this, in which we can you know talk and connect and and you know care for people who are isolated. Um, and at the same time, there are ways in which caring technologies, whether it's care robotics or the kind of use of care monitoring facilities, have been used by corporations in, in less caring ways. And then as well as the, the use of the platforms, we have the whole, the kind of logic of the companies as well, the kind of political logic of the corporations. So I think there's a whole host of uh, very nuanced questions there. And I think, um, you know, people are uh, obviously like yourself are, are talking about that and opening that up a bit. I mean, in, in the UK, uh, people like Emma Dowling and Helen Hester have been thinking about it recently. There've been some good um, programs and, and podcasts devoted to the subject, but I'd be interested to hear more from you as well.
Muchas gracias. Tenemos en YouTube una pregunta. Nos, nos preguntan, eh, Vanessa Mercano nos pregunta, ¿hay algún capítulo dedicado al cuidado y su importancia en el libro de The Care Manifiesto? Y también hay varias personas que nos han preguntado cómo se puede conseguir el libro. Verso books should be available in Mexico, are they not? Verso books? Um, I don't know. Um, are we getting a Spanish translation? We, we've, got a, we've got a Spanish yeah, translation. Um, and we've got both a Spanish and a Catalan translation, actually, which we could send you a copy of. Um, uh, Mm, but maybe we can get the publisher's details as well, because yes. mm. presume they will have an interest in, you know, promoting it in Mexico too, you know. Yes, yes. I would, yes, and probably I imagine if it comes from people in Mexico asking for the edition, then it's even better than us asking for them to send it to yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh, So in any way that we can help um, oh, contribute to that process. Nos dicen que está en la librería de Utópicas que está en Coyoacán, ahí está en la Ciudad de México, en esta librería se llama Utópicas. Eh, una persona en el chat nos comenta. Y también vía online se puede conseguir por algunas plataformas. Eh, eso es lo que nos están respondiendo personas por aquí, por el chat. Y bueno, eh, la, la pregunta era lo del autocuidado. Que si hay algún capítulo que hable dedicado al autocuidado y su importancia. Nos pregunta Vanessa Mercano. There's not a chapter on self-care. Um, we do refer to it saying um, that is what the neoliberal image of care is self-care, that we can all simply look after ourselves. So we are critical of the way in which Self-care is being promoted and pushed as though people have the time and resources, in particular the time, also the resources, you know, to be able to do all the caring for themselves, which is exactly what people don't have. So as we see it, it's a complete illusion that, um, you know, we can all be these um, totally resilient, self-caring people. It's, it, 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 it's, it's simply wrong. And I think that another way of thinking about it is one of the difficulties in the in imagining a caring world is we wanted precisely to get away from a conception of the individual. So it's not as if we're against self-care as such, but the way in which self-care has been um, trans transformed into sort of the, the solution to structural uh, violence and injustices And inequality. So self-care now is being touted by corporations. They, they're selling all of these commodities in order for us to focus on ourselves. And I think that, you know, we have to go back to the radical origins of self-care, you know, and Black feminist thought and Audre Lorde to think about, you know, how it, why and how it emerged self-care as a radical act. And I think that it can be, but I think we have to be very careful not to then fall back into sort of the neoliberal Uh, neoliberal notions of self-care. And the reason that we didn't have, uh, we, we begin our manifesto with a politics of care that sort of tries to decenter the individual. And we go directly from a politics of care to um, uh, caring kinship in order, again, to think about the ways in which we're always interdependent and embedded in relations. And that any kind of individuation is always, you know, it's preceded by relations of interdependence. So I think that would be the read, how I would say it. It's not as if we're you know, against self-care, of course not, but we're trying to think of in different ways about the self in relation um, and in political terms. Some of you um, there probably are aware of Lord Lauren Berlant's cruel optimism, which connects with this, the idea that we can be and have anything we want so long as you know we do enough ourselves in order to get it and as she said you know that is such a cruel delusion because for many people they will never have the time and resources to be able 
to become, you know, these assertive, <laughs> successful people they might like to be. So, yes, yeah, so we argue that, that self-care has been, you know, disproportionately fetishized. It's taken up so much space, you know, what Emma Dowling actually calls the care fix in her new book. Um, it, it's, it's touted at the expense of wider systems of social care. Um, and even, you know, there are ways in which the, that kind of black feminist tradition that Catherine was, talk, was talking about has itself been kind of refracted and sold as, as very individualized and personalized. So we want to kind of reroute the self as part of an interdependent framework and think about selves, selves as interdependent and interconnected. So in a way, yeah, just to add, in a way, the, I guess, implicit in our manifesto is the way we look at the self-care and wellness industry is part of the marketization story of care, right? And how self-care, the kind of self-care we are talking about nowadays is actually a very heavily marketized and commoditized model of self-care, not a radical model of self-care, uh, that definitely, if we follow the same argument, needs to be uh, demarketized and decommoditized and taken out of this spectacular, you know, uh, commodified uh, variety that we are encountering increasingly, you know, uh, nowadays. Okay, eh, yo tengo una pregunta, eh, justamente de lo que mencionaba Catherine al, hace un momento. Te, íbamos a tener un panel sobre los cuidados y su, la relación con la seguridad, la seguridad vista, no desde una mirada patriarcal, paternalista de ejercicio de, de poder sobre las personas, sino una seguridad donde podamos poner realmente los cuidados en el centro. Entonces, quisiera preguntar esto que decía Caterina hace un momento, ¿cómo se relaciona los cuidados desde una mirada de política pública con... Eh, la seguridad y con la violencia, por favor. Does anybody want to, I mean, I think it's a really interesting uh, question um, and I think there are a few ways of answering that. I mean, it, it really depends on how we define security, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically, um, the ways in which we see security uh, emerging, even you know, within sort of nationalist communities, which care that they're often exclusionary and often incredibly violent, right? So I think that we have to, I'm not sure that I would want to reclaim this notion of security. We might think of alternative notions that might do some of, you know, think about ways in which we can um, uh, minimize the, um, minimize human aggression and ambivalence. So I think that that was the project that we had in mind, which is, again, we're asking after the conditions that would allow for um, the, the vast majority of people to thrive. And we think that by creating these conditions that we will, we will, we will therefore uh, enable, we, will, we can therefore imagine and create a society in which we'll have you know, we'll, uh, much less violence and we'll have security in the ways that we think about it, but it's precisely by breaking down sort of our notions of nation states with, uh, with the violent policing of borders and boundaries. We talk about porous borders. Um, there was something else that I was gonna say, but then if you wanna step in and then I'll try and, uh, and Andreas will. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's part of uh, what we, it's also part of the, what we uh, talk about in the manifesto in terms of how care is uh, not, a, a, not a unified discourse. You know, there are different models of care we are currently uh, encountering. You know, it's, a, I mean, what we are trying to advance is a more progressive model of care, but we are also conscious that care, especially at this very moment in COVID times, is a term that has been appropriated by multiple actors, yeah, uh, to serve agendas that from our perspective are anything but caring yet they are done in the name of care, right? In the name of caring for citizens, yeah? In the name of caring for one's family, exercising patriarchal violence and so on and so forth. So uh, we're very aware that uh, care, uh, you know, as a term, as a keyword, uh, uh, in many ways is a contested uh, arena, right? Um, there are many, many uh, discourses and many practices 
that are done in the name of care that we don't necessarily agree with. So justifying violence in the name of care, for example, is one of them, right? Um, here, I guess we could also allude to Judith Butler's latest book, you know, uh, on violence and how she very much makes that point that, uh, you know, if you really want to, um, in a way, um, um, not reproduce violence, you have to um, change the terms in which you engage with it. Um, you know, that's a very gross simplification, but, you know, you cannot uh, respond to violence with violence in many ways. Um, it, also, I'm sorry. Yeah. it also links up very strongly with our arguments for the de-gendering of care, because a lot, we know that most physical violence has been associated with men, not only with men, but certainly with men protecting their masculinity, asserting themselves when, um, you know, they're feeling less powerful or trying to express their power over others. Now, the more we say, you know, we're all interdependent, we're all capable of care, we all need to care as well as be cared for. That's a way of trying to undermine the rigidities of our understandings of gender. And we crucially have to do that to create any sort of caring and peaceful and sustainable world. Men must be themselves the carers as much as women must be the carers and um you know it's going to take a little while to get there but that you know that degendering of care i think is one crucial aspect of thinking about where violence comes from and how one tackles violence a long term yeah uh, absolutely and and we we could also think about um, the secure security in terms of the security industries and how you know so much money has is been made through the extension of borders and policing and punitive systems of incarceration and how that's been bound up with a you know a neoliberal marketized logic not of not of caring for people in society but of you know, punishing people for the benefit of a few. So we talk about uh, that in term, in the beginning of the book in terms of structural carelessness. And we relate different systems of structural carelessness to neoliberalism. And we talk about that uh, in terms of, of borders as well. And the, the example um, of Melania Trump's jacket where she says on the back, I really don't care, do you? Is a kind of, you know, very graphic example of that system of structural carelessness. Muchas gracias. Eh, no sé si hay otra pregunta. Sí, eh, la, la, el, el asunto de la violencia en el caso de nuestro país, en el caso de México, estamos entre 10 y 11 mujeres asesinadas el día, al día, entre 11 a 10 feminicidios. Entonces, y hay una creciente militarización en este país. Entonces, tenemos eh, mucho trabajo por hacer para lograr tener, hacer un cambio de, de paradigma, tomando también en cuenta un machismo eh, sumamente fuerte todavía en muchos contextos en este país. Eh, ¿Hay alguna otra pregunta? Sí, eh, yo quisiera preguntarles eh, si la teoría queer se incorpora al manifiesto, si, lo han, si la han incorporado, y también este, cómo piensan a las personas de la diversidad sexogenérica dentro del manifiesto, cómo esta relación entre cuidados y diversidad sexual, ¿no? que también es importante, me parece hablar de ello. Gracias. Had Jamie been here, he would have been uh, speaking about uh, promiscuous care. And in fact, we draw precisely upon um, notions of promiscuous care that emerged out of the AIDS epidemic in particular, and um, how we need, how this notion of promiscuous care that we take from PRIMP, um, right? Um, uh, which is about caring more and uh, multiplying whom we care for is precisely the kind of ideal that we want to promote so that that, in, in a sense, disrupts heteronormative uh, family nuclear structures so that we have to think about um, kinship in a much more capacious and promiscuous way. Again, not indifferent, but as uh, creative and creating alternatives to the, the existing structures that we know are, 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 are often much less than caring and create certain kinds of violences. 
So had Jamie been here, that's precisely the moment where we use sort of um, initiatives um, that developed uh, the health initiatives of the AIDS epidemic and also um, the gay and lesbian liberation movements. So that definitely is actually where we begin in terms of the, the interpersonal relations where we try to challenge and disrupt uh, notions of intimacy that are, are heteronormative. Um, and I don't know if anybody else wants to talk a little bit more about promiscuous care. We think it's a, an incredible idea, a, a notion to think about promiscuous care as, as sort of uh, trans, uh, moving across all of these different scales of lives where we're multiplying uh, how we care for whom um, and in what ways. And essentially takes us back yet again to that challenging of um, heteronormative patterns. You know, women do one thing, men do the other. You know, all that comes straight out of the uh, gay, lesbian, and today trans movement. You know, that is all about rethinking how we care for each other, looking at patterns of violence and seeing, again, as Judith Butler in the text that Andreas referred to in her latest book on violence, you know, it's only once we recognize our interdependence that those patterns of violence um, can be challenged by seeing our own tendencies towards violence and then seeing, but we can't act out on those. We've got to live together harmoniously to create any sustainable and worthwhile world. So that very much links up with ideas coming from queer politics. Absolutely. And I think we take that up also throughout the manifesto in terms of how you know, we have to think through different models of kinship and moving beyond the heteronormative, not only on the kind of family level, but also on the level of policy and you know, how we're going to think through all the repercussions of how, uh, you know, the, the multiple ways in which society and, and different kind of kinship models can be organised has, has wider kind of um, policy repercussions as well. So you need to... Like our book deals with care in terms of different scales, you know, moving up from the very intimate to the community, to the state, to the nation, to the economy, to, to nature and the environment. And we try to kind of move back and forth throughout those different scales, throughout kind of pulling the threads back and forth as we go. Yeah, and I guess ultimately, you know, our model of care and we really talk about that is a model of care, a progressive model of care that is based on the notion of care across difference and across distance. So in a way, at the same time, it is a call for a more interdependent collectivist uh, way of organizing care and doing care. You know, care that extends even beyond identity politics. It's not just about caring for people about us in a social movement context. It's about trying to care promiscuously, yeah, about everyone, people that are not like us, people that are very far away, but also very close by, and so on and so forth. So that is definitely informed by queer theory as well. Muchas gracias. Este, rescato mucho ese término tan, tan interesante de cuidado promiscuo. Me parece que justo ahí se ve el posicionamiento político, ¿no? Y esta reivindicación y esta lucha política, este decir, aquí estamos, aquí aparecemos y, y, e incomodamos, ¿no? Y estamos presentes y vamos a seguir haciéndolo. Me, me encanta, la verdad. Muchas gracias. Eh, ¿Habrá alguna otra duda? ¿Alguna pregunta? A ver, aquí veo. En Perhaps nuestro you país, could tell us what you're hoping to achieve from um, the next few days, from the course or the conference. Sí, solamente eh, les comparto una pregunta que pone Sara Chávez. Sara nos dice, en nuestro país hay una gran deuda no solo por parte de las instituciones de gobierno, sino de la sociedad como colectivo con relación a las hijas e hijos de mujeres víctimas de feminicidios. La pregunta es, ¿cómo nos hacemos responsables como sociedad 
de la creciente violencia por razones de género que afecta de manera grave y directamente a niñas, niños y niñas. Gracias. What a terrible thing to have to consider. Um, it would surely take us back to local community networks. And I don't know what networks of resistance that you have there. I can only hope that there are networks of resistance. Like for instance, you know, we used to hear all about the mothers of the disappeared um, in Argentina and so on. I don't know what networks perhaps associated with the Zapatistas. Uh, I don't know what mutual aid structures you have, but I would have thought that it's rallying around those, attempting to build and support those, would it not be? But I mean, we're too ignorant, I'm afraid, of you know the networks in Mexico itself. I mean, other than two deplore in total horror the levels of femicide there. And I mean, there has been a big feminist resistance movement, hasn't there? Every Woman Matters, as I understand it, part of the global women's strike and so on. All these things are crucial, but how you create real care and structures at an everyday level, of course you need resources for that, you need time for that. So you'd have to tell us really how you can help build and preserve them, I think. Absolutely. I think that's a, a, one, you know, a, a great response. And I think that there are different levels of answering that question. So one is also on the level of what do we do now? And I think that Lynn is absolutely right. And I think it's ni uno menos, the you know, feminist mobilization in South, in South America has been incredibly um, vocal and visible. And I think that that needs, you know, that's an amazing um, moment and movement. But I also think that we have to think not only about what we do in response to those femicides, but we have to think about how, again, what are the conditions that would uh, eliminate those kinds of femicides? And that's exactly what, you know, the kind of intellectual exercise, which doesn't give the concrete answers in the Mexican context right now, even though, um, you know, it's, it's relief for people who are there and, and resisting to tell us. But I think it even more in the long, in thinking towards the future, it's also about, okay, what are the structures that have created this, this kind of gendered violence? How do we prevent it at all the different scales that we're talking about? Um, and so I think that's also something that, you know, the re root causes of, and, we, and even if we can't, you know, detail all of the root causes, we know a lot of them. And one of the ways that we are arguing for is precisely through creating these kinds of caring communities, which are resourced and have the kind of caring infrastructure and shared infrastructure and time, um, which would eliminate some of the root causes, if not um, most of them. Um, and whilst we, you know, obviously we don't know a lot about the Mexican context, it has been very cheering to read so much about New Nomenos and um, just to see the, you know, the power of the resistance movement uh, against femicide and how that's been so powerful through South and Central America and, and globally. And I, I've been very in, interested as well in how so much of that movement has connected um, violence against women to the broader social systems of discrimination and misogyny and patriarchy and has looked at them in relation to uh, different forms of disproportionate social and economic power. So for example, work like um, Veronica Gago's book, you know, Feminist International, How to Change Everything, and uh, the work they've done in looking at how systems of debt um, uh, rely on, on feminized labor, on the idea that women can care and should care more and should care for free and should take the burden, are, are bound up and connected to um, their abuse and the violence against them, you know, work work like that is is very powerful and as an important place to to for us to start reading about it and learning about it. Certainly. Yeah. 
Eh, también hay otra pregunta del público, bueno, más que un comentario, que dice, dice Dolores Rodríguez. La propuesta plantea el cuidado desde una perspectiva de género que proponga que el trabajo no recaiga solo en las mujeres, ¿no? Lo cual justo es, creo que es lo que estaba comentando un poco yo al tema de, de la relación entre patriarcado y cuidados, ¿no? Y quizás también hablar de estas dobles jornadas que, que viven las mujeres, porque, por ejemplo, en México se da mucho, toda, mucho actualmente, que más por la pandemia, ¿no? Que las mujeres trabajan formalmente fuera de sus casas y llegan y de pronto hay como un ambiente de entendimiento en el que ella tiene que seguir trabajando desde casa, limpiando, ¿no? Y aunque el hombre también trabaje fuera igual que ella, él de pronto asume que no tiene responsabilidades, ¿no? Entonces, vuelve el tema del patriarcado, ¿no? En, en ese tema de, 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 de cuidados que, que, que tiene que ser reformado, también tiene que cambiarse, ¿no? Y pensar en otras formas de cuidar juntes, juntas, juntos. ¿no? Gracias. Absolutely. And so, so much of so much of that is about you know thinking about masculinity, isn't it? And and different models of masculinity and what what should and is being socially valued. So you know, kind of male carelessness in the household is something that has a social social and cultural value, needs to be challenged, and different models of masculinity need to be you know, valorized and, and presented and contested and shown to be culturally important, I think. So again, that's where the kind of is, scales are quite interesting models to work with, you know, it, no matter what context you're in, because you can think about how those different models of carelessness and care are interrelated. Lynn, you... Well, uh, no, I, I mean, it's part of the whole vi violence of the whole society, isn't it? Because actually, things can change quite fast. I mean, in my childhood, no man ever changed a nappy or pushed a pram, did the washing up, nothing, you know? And now it would be pretty rare for men not to do that in, you know, the wealthier uh, Western countries. But on the other hand, going back to Mexico, I think, you know, one huge stress and pressure on masculinity is the general violence that is there, the corruption that's there in the society generally, isn't it? And so, you know, exactly when and how you begin, you have to be tackle it at every level. I guess going back to our favorite word, scales, <laughs> care has to be practiced at every scale. And, and the less it exists, you know, at one scale, the more it will be undermined at another scale. So trying to get changes in the home, you know, does depend on, you know, getting rid of that corruption and violence in the communities, in the police, in the political system, doesn't it? And wow, that's a big task. Which, uh, it's not easy for us to answer and being so close to the USA doesn't help, does it? <laughs> Muchas gracias. <laughs> Eh, sí, sobre lo que nos preguntaban, ¿qué esperamos? Tenemos este ciclo de diálogos, de saberes, lo, lo quisimos nombrar así eh, porque justamente pensamos que es, es una manera de que, de manera, no me atrevo a decir colectiva porque no es... Eh, tan grande, pero sí de manera grupal podamos compartir diferentes miradas sobre la, pues, la cuestión de los cuidados y su centralidad, porque con toda la pandemia muchas personas empezaron a hablar de los cuidados y los cuidados y primero desde un reclamo de por qué a las mujeres se nos exigía tanto, después pues haciendo los análisis de la relación que estas demandas tienen en cuestiones de género con los roles asignados a, a nosotras, la violencia eh, eh, de género que se destapó en, 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 en la pandemia, o sea, que, que se fue más evidente, siempre ha existido y existe de manera continua, constante, pero durante la pandemia fue muy sí, visible. Everywhere. No sé si porque las tecnologías permitieron que, que lo pusiéramos mucho más en evidencia de lo que ya estaba. Entonces... Estas conversaciones con diferentes grupos en diferentes redes, pues justamente nos llevaron a, a, 
a pensarlo y a platicarlo, en especial con, con Jorge, con la doctora Mercedes Alcañiz, que, que, que ha formado parte de esta organización, y, y reflexionar qué hacemos y cómo lo hacemos, ¿no? Con, de, desde qué múltiples puntos de vista y miradas. Entonces, eh, teníamos pensado incluir la parte de cuidados y seguridad. Desafortunadamente, la panelista tuvo un problema muy serio y entonces no va a poder participar el día de mañana. Pero también hablaremos, eh, nos hablarán de las redes globales del cuidado, nos hablarán de cuestiones de la ética del cuidado. Se está por aquí la doctora Irene Cummings, no sé si ella quisiera comentar brevemente algo al respecto. Eh, estará María Teresa, que también ya eh, comentó algo hace un momento, también si ella quisiera comentar algo adelante. Jorge, ¿no? que, que estamos como eh, eh, de las personas que participaremos en estos días eh, de alguna manera en la organización o como oponentes, pues creemos que, que es muy importante darle voz y nosotros en el programa de género e inclusión de la Universidad Iberoamericana eh, siempre pensamos en, en cómo hacerlo. Eh, eh, sí nos gustan muchísimo... Eh, acercarnos a las teorías, reflexionar sobre ellas, pero lo que más nos, eh, nos interesa, porque nos hemos dado cuenta que ahí hay un vacío, es cómo. Porque podemos entender la problemática del patriarcado, podemos entender estos roles asignados, podemos entender la importancia de los cuidados, pero muchas veces, y esto lo he visto cuando he trabajado con estudiantes, la pregunta es, muy bien, ya lo entendí, dime cómo. ¿Cómo cambio? ¿Qué estrategias utilizo para cambiar esta masculinidad tóxica? ¿De qué manera evito que el patriarcado llegue incluso a los libros de texto? ¿De qué manera logro que esta mirada eh, patriarcal, que esta eh, violencia cultural esté en el cine, en la publicidad, en el arte, en las familias, en, en la sociedad en general? ¿Cómo le hago? Entonces... Estos ciclos de saber, de diálogos, lo hicimos pensando en compartir, pues, ideas, eh, propuestas de cómo hacerlo, de qué manera, y, y seguir generando reflexiones, porque sí, sí estamos, eh, tenemos el convencimiento, tenemos la seguridad de que eh, es una pequeña piedrita que aventamos al agua y algo, algo, hará, algunas puertas se abrirán, algún camino nos van a marcar para ir detonando cambios pues, en, en las pequeñas, en las familias, en las comunidades y ojalá en los países también, ¿no? Y en las relaciones multilaterales. Eso es algo que yo podría decir, no sé, las demás personas que he nombrado si quieren participar. Mercedes. Sí, Mercedes. Hola, buenos días en México, buenas tardes en Europa, en España en concreto. Yo en primer lugar quiero felicitar a, a las personas que han participado en esta primera sesión. El libro me ha parecido muy sugerente, no lo conocía, pero bueno, ya lo encargo eh, seguro para leerlo y poder bueno, conversar en, <risa> próximamente con ustedes. Y en segundo lugar, quiero felicitar a la Universidad Iberoamericana por la organización de este curso, que me parece de una importancia que, que no se debería hacer solo en un curso de una universidad, sino debería de ser para toda la sociedad. Yo creo que, como han platicado antes, es, los cuidados son la sostenibilidad de la vida, es que si no nos cuidamos, pues no vivimos. Y ante esto, y, y aprovecho también pues, para darle un poco de publicidad al curso, la perspectiva que se ha dado me parece estupenda, ver económicamente cómo se ha hecho, teóricamente, porque desde el concepto de la ética del cuidado que nos presentará Irene Comins, pues creo que este tema se ha centrado mucho y se ha desarrollado, tema político, tema global, porque las redes, las redes globales de cuidado están ahí, las tenemos en Europa, las tienen también en Latinoamérica, entre unos países y otros, y bueno, yo creo que es un tema 
yo diría, no sé si la palabra en inglés cómo lo van a traducir las traductoras, intersticial, o sea que está, tiene como muchas patas, ¿no? porque es el Estado, es la economía, es la, la globalización, todo esto se ha manifestado ahora en la, con la crisis de la pandemia, ¿no? que hemos visto todo lo que, lo que ha pasado. Pero hay una cosa que me parece fundamental y es un cambio en la cultura de género. Un, ver cómo se puede cambiar el patriarcado, porque si no se cambia la mentalidad de, de patriarcal, no, por muchos esfuerzos que haga el Estado, por muchos eh, adelantos teóricos que hagan las, eh, las académicas, las feministas, no vamos a cambiar. Si queremos que el cuidado sea central, hay que cambiar la mentalidad, hay que socializar en cuidado desde, la, desde chiquitos, desde, tierna, desde la tierna infancia para cambiar, si queremos, este modelo, que sé que es muy utópico porque entra en contradicción con toda la sociedad que vivimos, ¿no? pero si lo queremos hay que, que apostar. Y bueno, felicitaciones a, a las panelistas, felicitaciones a la Ibero, a, Elvia, a la doctora Elvia sobre todo por la organización. Muchas gracias. Gracias Mercedes, olvidé también mencionar que, que un enfoque que también nos pareció sumamente importante y enriquecedor incluir es la mirada desde los pueblos originarios y entonces estará participando el último día con una conferencia magistral de cierre eh, Lorena Cabnal, que es una mujer maya, quiche y bueno ella, Lorena, además es feminista entonces nos va a hacer favor de dar la, la conferencia porque es, es otra mirada también muy, muy importante eh, pues para poder incluir la diversidad. ¿Me explico? Gracias. No sé si puedo intervenir. Bueno, en primer lugar, dar la enhorabuena a la, a la Ibero, a Elvia, por este ciclo, este estos diálogos tan interesantes y tan necesarios sobre el cuidado y también me gustaría felicitar a, a los ponentes, a las ponentes de, de esta tarde, me ha encantado escucharlo del cuidado promiscuo, me encanta, ¿no? Cómo el cuidado debe de ir más allá de ese, de ese círculo, ¿no? Que tradicionalmente consideramos de la, del ámbito familiar, ¿no? Y, y un, un cuidado, como decía Catherine, eh, político también, ¿no? Desde desde esa comprensión. Me ha gustado muchísimo también esa crítica al, al autocuidado, ¿no? que ahora parece que se nos vende y que al final es como una, como, bueno, como, como que el sistema eh, se quita problemas, no es responsabilidad del sistema, de la, politica, de la política, sino de cada uno que nos autocuidemos. ¿no? Entonces creo que se han apuntado cosas muy interesantes, muy originales, y quiero darles las gracias porque bueno, he tomado muchas notas me ha encantado escuchar a Aline Segal y, y creo que también la reflexión sobre las nuevas masculinidades es fundamental. Es fundamental. Yo desde mi, mi línea de investigación eh, me gusta siempre decir la frase de que debemos desgenerizar el cuidado para generalizarlo. Y yo creo que eso es uno de los caminos eh, y, y una, en este debate sobre la relación entre violencia paz y cuidados, yo pienso que es fundamental, fundamental desgenerizar el cuidado porque la práctica del cuidado hace que desarrollemos habilidades de paz, cuidar significa tener empatía, escuchar al otro, responsabilizarme, comprometerme y esto de, debe de dejar de ser solo una responsabilidad de la mitad de la humanidad, esto debe de ser un valor humano, no un rol de género, de ahí que, que, que mi idea es esa, ¿no? Y bueno, de verdad, muchísimas gracias. Me han contado escucharos a cada uno de vosotros. Un placer. Thank you. No sé si alguien quiera comentar algo más. Quiero, uh, me pide eh, una colega muy querida, que es Vanessa Marcano, que, que nos hizo la pregunta sobre el autocuidado. Ella explica esto. Cuando hice la pregunta de la importancia del autocuidado, me refería a que en Latinoamérica las mujeres cuidamos demasiado a los otros. 
y nos olvidamos de nosotras mismas, nos abandonamos, y esto socialmente en América Latina se premia, ¿no? Esta visión de mujer sacrificial en América Latina es muy, muy, muy premiada, muy aplaudida, eh, la mujer que da la vida por los demás, y socialmente esto se premia. A eso me refería con rescatar la necesidad de aumentar nuestra autoestima, y esto impacta eh, en entornos de violencia y dependencia. Entiendo, entiendo dice Mar, eh, Vanessa, entiendo la perspectiva del manifiesto que busca un sentido de comunidad, pero en un contexto de primer mundo en el que las mujeres están por lo general bien, creo que la mirada desde Latinoamérica podría tener otra mirada. A eso me refería con, con la pregunta, con esta mirada de... Eh, en Latinoamérica, de poner la mirada así en el autocuidado, o sea, desmontar este estereotipo de que la mujer valiosa, la feminidad más aplaudida, es aquella que da la vida por los demás, que el amor que, el amor que implica dar tu vida por, por las demás, olvidándote de ti misma. Eh, no sé si me estoy dando a, a entender bien eh, y traduciendo lo que nos no, that's Vanessa. very clear. I take us back to Andre Law, doesn't it? And to those who are not expected to uh, be cared for, but simply to do all the caring. Catherine, you were about to say something, were you? Absolutely. So in the context that you're that you're describing in Mexico, it's a so self-care is an act of radical care. And it needs to be absolutely needs to be thought about in the tradition of radical care, uh, like in black feminist thought. Um, so so the, the kind of analysis that we gave does emerge from our position in the UK and also um, in the global north. So I think that's a very, very important point and commentary on the, the ways in which self-care can and is often in particular contexts uh, an act of radical care. Except there is a caveat. I mean, first of all, you would have to feed class into this conversation. And on the other hand, um, there are incredibly high levels of um, um, plastic surgery and so on, as I understand it, um, in Latin America for women to try and create themselves as the perfect looking women, you know, the sorts of women they're expected to be. And that could be seen as self-care. So I think one would have to unpack it a little to uh, uh, make sure that we weren't just going along with some commercialized patriarchal notion of uh, self-care. Also, it's um, a slightly different tangent. It's really interesting to hear you, you speak about the conference and, and why it came about and what you're covering. And um, since the book came out, we've, we've kind of spoken in quite a few different spaces and it's been really interesting. Oh, sorry. It's been really interesting the extent to which uh, care has become a keyword during the pandemic, you know, obviously because the, the kind of realization that we need care is so crucial. Um, but it's it's taken on lots of different characteristics in different geographical spaces and places, you know, both within countries and cities in all kinds of stratified, complicated ways. Um, but I, at the, and at the same time, so care has become more, more valued, more conspicuous. And at the same time, it seems to be the case that there is a kind of battle over who should claim care and what it should mean. So the kind of things Andreas was talking about um, and, and you were talking as well, Irene, about the importance of thinking about the political dimension of care. You know, is are we being presented with a with kinds of care washing um, that aren't really genuine, thorough, interdependent care at all? Um, you know, what kinds of care do we want? What kinds of care are, are, tr are truly extensively, genuinely caring for the, the, the most number of people? Seem to be really important questions. Well. No sé, Jorge, algún comentario, alguna pregunta, otras personas. No veo más preguntas en momento en el solo felicitaciones en YouTube a, la, a las personas panelistas han sido han sido varias este, este, eh, ahí está el, el público asistente está muy contento y, y mandan muchas muchos agradecimientos y felicitaciones. 
Sí, nosotros vamos a compartir la versión en español también por YouTube. Eh, en, una vez que haya pasado, lo vamos a subir en, en español también, porque ahora la transmisión es en inglés. ¿Algún comentario, Jorge, sobre lo que esperamos sobre estos diálogos? Sí, bueno, va a ser un privilegio enorme estar presentes. Este, esperemos también que, que conté con su presencia al grupo de Care Collective para las siguientes sesiones. Con mucho gusto les estaremos recibiendo y dialogando, sobre todo que el objetivo aquí es dialogar sobre el tema de cuidados y sus múltiples intersecciones, sus múltiples aristas. Y, y bueno, ya como comentaba él bien, la siguiente, en los siguientes días vamos a ver la relación con la seguridad, la relación con los pueblos originarios, las redes globales de cuidados, ya tenemos eh, bueno, a un grupo experto, de, un grupo de expertas muy, muy variado, muy, muy rico, muy interesante. Entonces, pues más que invitadas, más que invitados a, a las siguientes sesiones que con mucho gusto vamos a estar escuchando y va a ser muy, muy interesante, estoy seguro. Great, good luck with everything. I'm sure it's going to be really exciting and um, everybody's going to learn a lot. I wish I could come, but I'm at another conference on caring and age over the next few days. So. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. And thank you for the wonderful and generative questions. And uh, there's so much still to discuss um, going, going uh, proceeding onward. So thank you so much. I hope we meet again. Sí, muchísimas gracias. Gracias, gracias. muchas gracias por, por esta presentación al Care Collective. Eh, las conferencias de mañana ten, tuvieron modificaciones. La conferencia de seguridad y cuidados eh, no se va a, a llevar a cabo. Y la otra conferencia que da la doctora Maya Pérez, Orozco, se cambia para el día 24 de este mes, de las 11 a la 1 de la tarde, hora de México. Y bueno, pero las demás conferencias siguen en pie. Entonces nos vemos el día 23 con la doctora Irene Cummins, a quien tendremos el enorme gusto de volver a escuchar. Y bueno, y las demás panelistas que, que también están en, en nuestro programa. Les agradecemos muchísimo. Eh, eh, y bueno, está increíble que ya podamos tener también el libro aquí en México. Hasta hace poco solamente era online. Entonces está increíble que las compañeras de Utópicas lo tengan a la venta. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, si no hubiera mayor más eh, comentarios, pues eh, cerraríamos uh -huh. esta sesión. Y bueno, pues agradeciendo muchísimo. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Muchas gracias, que el colectivo. Gracias a todas por asistir. Gracias, Jorge, también a ti eh, por toda la organización.